In the world of pro football, toughness is a vital part of a player's anatomy. And like a muscle, it must be built up and flexed. Many rugged individuals have played in the National Football League, but only a few have managed to turn toughness into greatness. This is a film about pro football's tough guys. These guys are coming low in there. I, I got punched in the n**s in a pile, so be oh, careful yeah. in there. They're not fooling around. Some men can throw a football 80 yards, while others can leap so high that they even seem to defy gravity. And certain defensive players, they possess that uncanny instinct, that sixth sense, for stopping a play before it ever gets started. But arm strength and agility and concentration are talents that can only take an athlete so far. Nobody can make in the NFL without toughness. You're about to meet seven of the toughest customers who ever played. Eight, if you count me. Now, I played in an era where you had to be tough to survive. And the first two tough guys I'm going to introduce were contemporaries of mine. Now, I played with Big Ed Obradovich on some bear teams that really terrorized the opponents. And I admired Jim Taylor of the Green Bay Packers, who played with a style that was very close to my heart. And any defender who wanted to tangle with Taylor could expect to pay for it with bruises and bite marks. Now, during the 1960s, Obradovich and Taylor demonstrated what it meant to be a tough guy in the NFL. Oh, Jimmy Taylor was unbelievable. He was a fierce, fierce competitor. Well, I didn't try to do anything. It's when you're out there, it's a matter of, you know, the survival of the fittest. Usually a running back breaks the line of scrimmage and looks for the end zone. Jimmy looked for the first safety he could run over. I just tried to play at a very high level of intensity and play to my potential. He liked to hit people. He's got a body that was built for hitting people. You know, there'd be a nice hole here. He'd rather bounce off of this guy and then hit the hole. You know, he liked to punish people. I just tried to play to my maximum ability, and I, I played very, very aggressive, and I played within the bounds of the rules of the game. And then when anybody tackled him, it was an insult. And if he bit them, or punched them in the groin, or pushed their face in the mud, 
fine. If they were trying to get me upset or get me mad or for me to start a fight and to get thrown out of a game, then I can't be, a, you know, a good football player sitting on the sidelines ejected from a football game. So I just let my performance speak for me. But those of us that had to play against those guys, we were up there begging him, Jimmy, leave the guy alone, you know, just get back in the huddle because he's getting ready to destroy my head because you're chewing on his ankle again. I'm certainly not trying to punish or hurt or inflict pain on a, uh, on a on an opponent. Oh, sure. Jimmy will deny it, but he bit guys that tackled him. Where did you find all this research on me where I would scream and yell and, huh? I don't recall any of these interviews or, or no. this happening uh, during my career. Maybe you sure you have the right uh, ball carrier? See, that was all part growing up for him. You know, he was an obscure running back from LSU, you know. Billy Cannon was the star. Nobody knew Jimmy Taylor, the running back. It was his last game as a rookie. Finally let him play, we were completely out of it, and Taylor ran over everybody. He gained 170 yards on his own with no blocking. He killed people. He ran over them, around them. Lombardi came in and saw this performance, and immediately he was our fullback. This was his way to become known, you know. He would show you that he could run over a guy bigger than he was and punish him. You know, I'd rather punish him than punish me, you know. He started to grow up. And he started to become a star, and he liked it. Jimmy Taylor never could remember anybody's first name, so he called him Roy or some other things that I can't mention. He'd, he'd walk down the hall and he'd say, Hi, Roy. How's it going, Roy? Good to see you, Roy. Good morning, Roy. To everybody. I didn't believe in any gimmicks at all. No superstitions, no frills. Just knocked down, hard-fought football, and that's where it's going to be played. It's combat, and you have to know that you're going you're gonna to be subjected to pain or to suffering. So it's a matter of accepting all of this up front. You're saying, well, it is going to be painful. In the training or in the conditioning is where you, in your preparation. He was the greatest conditioned athlete that I had ever been around. When Lombardi would have the grueling grass drills for which he was so famous, he could never make Jimmy tired. And then we run our 200 yards. Jimmy, he said, uh, don't breathe so hard. We want to set a good example for the rookies. I said, what do you mean? He said, you're a veteran now. We want to set a good example, and you're huffing and puffing. I said, well, gosh, i got to breathe. I need oxygen. I said, what do you expect me to do? He said, just blow it out. But he would do all of that running I and mean, all those grass drills, and he was not breathing hard. He was just absolutely in perfect condition, and it was a test of courage to him. And I enjoyed football because of the competition and the combat and the uh, pain and the suffering. I'd probably do it, uh, do it the same way. Jimmy Taylor, toughest guy in football. Edel Bradovich was a giant, a defensive end. He would be the Hulk Hogan of his day. The words used to describe Ed Obradovich, number 87, were always the same. Wild, tough, relentless. And although there was no disputing their accuracy, it was easy to wonder if they went far enough because the career of Ed Obradovich was always filled with trouble. First, there was the trouble he created for quarterbacks, attacking their blockers and eliminating their potential receivers at the same time. Then there was the trouble he made for himself with his fiery temper. His personality ran on iron rails, and once the track was chosen, there was no way to swerve or go back. Ed was always wild, uh, volatile. It was, he's like World War III walking down the street. He could go off anytime. OB, 
That crazy son of a gun, I'm gonna tell you what. Uh, when I first got to the Bears, uh, there wasn't enough whiskey in uh, Chicago to feed him. Before kickoff, OB was a friendly sort, but once the game began, he became a heavy duty hitman. He was a player without much subtlety in a time that demanded even less. I think in the years that I played, I think I can, there were some guys that were really, you know, uh, you like to catch them, you know, in the bar afterwards or somewhere and say, you know, now that you're facing me, pal, you know, how tough are you? The gratifying thing about it is when you can get to the quarterback. And those were some other people I didn't like. You know, at the time, I'm making 10-5, and these guys are making 105, you know, and you just, uh, you had a great hate for them. On running plays, the Bears' defense was designed for Obradovich to occupy as many blockers as possible. So the middle linebacker, Dick Butkus, number 51, could flow unencumbered to make the tackle. I'm stringing this play out like I'm supposed to do. Lo and behold, unbeknownst to me, who's right behind me is Butkus, the monster. I'm getting a sh I mean, I'm getting the hell beat out of me going along the way, and he makes the tackle right at the end, just before the guy goes out of line and kills him. And I'll never forget it. And Abe Gibbon was one of our defensive coaches, and he says, for sake, Obradovich, take a look at yourself. You're upside down on the ground. Butkus, great job. I thought to myself, oh, I'll be damn. <laughs> I take out four guys, he makes the tackle, never got touched. We'd watch me watching movies, and, 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 he'd, and he'd be getting up, and his helmet would be sideways, and he took out about three guys, and he says, way to fight off the blockers, Dick. <laughs> I'd be getting up off the tackle, and, and no one was there because he took on everybody. Whenever I made a tackle, which was few and far between, I remember Dick saying, hold him up, hold him up, you know, because he wanted to come in and really cracking me on. I'm saying, hold him up for <laughs> sake, I'm hanging on. The hell do you mean, hold him up? You know, what, make you look like a hero? <laughs> Ed Obradovich traded macho for manners and sweat for polish. He was a high-octane mixture of cussing and fussing, but his tank was never empty. When you teed it up, as they say, on Sunday afternoon, well, you could count on OB, because he was there to play, and he would be there till the last dog was hung. That's a hell of a man, Ed Obradovich. When Jack Lambert was the leader of Pittsburgh's famed steel curtain defense, he had a game face that was downright frightening, and he hit with a fury that made him one of the most intimidating linebackers ever to play the game. Now, the Giants' Mark Vivero, he's a tight end who's tough. He once carried half the San Francisco defense on his back while picking up a crucial first down. Now, you're probably thinking, you wouldn't want to run into these guys off the field, but Bavaro and Lambert are nice guys, and they really care about what's going on around them. They have done something in their communities to make the world a better place to live in. They proved that even tough guys can have a tender streak. Nobody knew how tough Mark Bavaro was when he joined the New York Giants in 1985 because, quite frankly, nobody really wanted to find out. I tell you, he's a stone face, that Bavaro now. You know what the hell he's thinking. I'd hate to have to fight that son of a gun. Bavaro, number 89, plays tight end. And he seems to have been chiseled from the same granite of greatness that produced Mike Ditka and John Mackey. For like those great tight ends of the past, he is versatile and tough. He's really aggressive, and he has the ability to hit you just as hard as you hit him or when he catches the ball. So when you make a tackle on Bavaro, you better be ready to wrap up and have all your gills turning, you know, because uh, he's going to deliver a blow to you. I see him catch a pass and drag two, three people. My eyes light up because he's the way I would be if I was a tight end. I respect him so much, I, I wouldn't even play a joke on him.
late in the game. We had to be happened to beat Houston uh, that day, 35 to 14, and of course we were just running the ball. It finally comes down to the two-minute warning. We're glad this game's going to be over with, and we're standing in the huddle. And the play comes in. It's, oh, slant 35. Oh, okay. And I hear, I look at Mark, and he goes, oh. and I said, you know, he just makes a lot. I said, Mark, you know, what's wrong? You don't want to run that? He goes, I want to run it to the other side. And I said, oh, what difference does it make? I want to hit him one more time. <laughs> you know, so there's somebody over there he must have had this thing going with, and he wanted to hit this guy just one more time before the game was over, and uh, I guess leave this guy with impression that night before he went home. He's a very tough football player, the kind of guy that, that's very disciplined, very determined in how he approaches the game, you know, the kind of guy that you can hit him on a good play and hit him hard, knock him down, and if, he's, if he can get up, he's going to go back to the huddle and he's going to come at you the next time just as hard as he did the first time. Mark Bavaro's pain threshold has yet to be ascertained. In 1986, the New Orleans Saints knocked out some of his teeth, yet he barely missed a play and came back to catch seven passes in a Giants victory. Such bravery has earned Mark Bavaro a reputation for toughness and reliability, while his uncanny resemblance to Sylvester Stallone has spawned a nickname he'd sooner not hear, Rambo. I feel Rambo is just a fictional character who exploits Vietnam veterans. Um, my cousin and my uncle were in Vietnam. I have a lot of respect for them, and I feel it's an honor to serve your country. It's an honor that wasn't bestowed upon me, and I don't want to have it given to me cheaply. There is nothing artificial about Mark Bavaro's reputation on or off the football field. In 1986, his second NFL season, Bavaro earned all pro honors while helping to lead the Giants to the world championship. Away from the game, his devotion to helping the March of Dimes and others who are less fortunate runs as deep as his dedication to winning football games. It's good to go where they don't know who you are. It's very humbling, and so they find out you're a football player, and that's all they care about. It's good that a football player will take his time and come to see them. It really makes them happy. The ones who are fans really know. And we sit down, we analyze everything, and you know, they tell me it's all right when I drop a ball. It makes you feel good and that there's something they care about. It's just my way of, of giving back to the kids who aren't as fortunate, and it's just a good feeling. Toughness and durability have helped make number 89 a perennial all-pro. But his compassion and dedication has made him a real-life hero. He's just the kind of guy that, uh, if you had to go into the trenches tomorrow, that's the kind of guy you'd like to be in the trenches with. Sims is looking for a target. Sims, end zone! Touchdown, Bavaro! Mark Bavaro, a tough guy with a tender heart. Legend has it, he ate glass and pounded his head against lockers before waging war. He announced on a Monday night game that he hailed from Buzzard's Breath, Wyoming. He decreed that all quarterbacks should wear dresses. He was Count Dracula in cleats, the remorseless linebacker for Pittsburgh, Transylvania. Double wing right, ace! <laughs> That'll cool your ass off. In high school, John Harold Lambert was a skinny quarterback and sharp-elbowed basketball player. However, in 1974, the Steelers picked him as a backup outside linebacker. Ham and Russell were fixtures there, but when inside linebacker Henry Davis was injured, a terror was unleashed. He stood 6'3 and weighed only 204 as a rookie, the exact size as jet wide receiver Al Toon. Still, his toothpick legs always got his toothless face to the ball. 
In a game of angles and position, he never took the wrong step, and he was always the most focused man on the field. Every season, he led the team in tackles. For nine straight years, he bashed his way to the Pro Bowl. Eventually, the kid the Steelers took a chance on was chewing out all pros like Jack Ham. The middle linebacker is supposed to be the leader. I could never understand why some people had to be motivated. Uh, but, uh, and I, I tried not to yell and scream too much, but sometimes when we were playing very poorly, you know, I felt that a few words were necessary, and that's usually when I did my yelling and screaming. Interference! Oh, you I never looked at professional football as a popularity contest. I look at it uh, as my job. I don't care that, that my opponents like me. I care that they respect me, though. Number 58 considered it his job to hit someone on every play. When one of his teammates received an out-of-bounds cheap shot, Lambert had another job to perform. He raced the length of the bench to exact the punishment. He thought it his duty to teach the Browns a lesson because as a kid, he loved them. And they didn't draft him. But it was in Super Bowl X when Captain Jack first earned his reputation as an intimidator and enforcer. It wasn't something that I sat down and planned to do. You know, I didn't think about things out there, I just reacted. And the Cliff Harris incident in the Super Bowl out there, I never thought about doing something like that, but I saw him whacking Roy on the helmet, I turned around, I just grabbed him and threw him down, and that just happened just like that. I think sometimes I got the feeling people thought I was a dirty football player, and that always bothered me, because I, I never went out and tried to hurt anybody or anything like that. Now, I, I could play, I could play any way you wanted to play it. I mean, we had some guys out there that, from time to time that wanted to do some things that weren't legal, and I can, I can do that too if I have to. <laughs> but I'd rather play by the rules and play fairly. But I don't think that if you intimidate, you know, there's no cowards out there on that field, buddy. Today, there's a new field for Jack Lambert, and that's in Alliance, Ohio where he spends his summers molding intelligent linebackers and responsible citizens. Good stretch today, good stretch. Last full day of camp, we don't want any pulled muscles now. All right. <laughs> good job. That's what you've got to go over in your mind every single time. When you say 5-2, mo cover one, and break, you don't go stand at the line of scrimmage and see if, look, if there's any pretty girls in the stands over there, okay? You've got to be thinking out here. You can be average if you want to be, but if you want to be a great football player, you've got to concentrate, and you've got to have the right intensity, okay? A couple times out here yesterday when we were playing, some of you guys, and I got a little bit angry, but I, I get excited when I play. You've got to get excited when you play football. you got to. All right? You gotta be excited. If you don't want to get excited out here, then you gotta go play tennis or something like that. You should take pride in the fact that you're, you're one of the very few people in the world that can do what you're doing, play in the National Football League, and you should go out here and try and be the best you can be, you know, game after game. And hopefully when it's all over, you can look back on your career and be proud of it, you know, as I am of mine. Conrad Dobler earned a reputation for being mean and nasty. But his sense of humor about his career suggests that he was only acting out a part. And some critics might say that he overacted. But that's what made Conrad Dober one of the most colorful, tough guys ever to play in the NFL. The game's violent. I'm not. I was just a, an arm to that. But it was nice to run into someone and hit him so hard. I used to call it a snot bubbler. That's when you hit him so hard, you just see that little bubble of snot come out of his nose there. He knew he was laid into. And I, I've had some snot bubbles laid on me, too. <laughs> and I'd get up and say, boy, that was a good one. But I'll tell you what, I'm going to find you before the game's over. <laughs> We're going to trade this one off. We'll be back. But I enjoy pounding on them, because I like to have them believe that, hey, here's a boy from Wyoming that just handed you your lunch. But before Conrad Dober could hand anyone their lunch, he would have to sing for his in the training camp tradition of a rookie singing for his supper. Where have all the flowers gone? Long time ago. Where have all the flowers gone? Long time St. Louis Cardinal veterans were less than impressed with his cocky kid from Laramie. 
And it wasn't just his singing voice. Conrad Dobler made more mistakes during his rookie training camp than any player I've ever seen. And Dobler kept jumping off sides, and he kept blowing plays. And we kept hearing how smart he was that he had over a three-point average at Wyoming, and we didn't buy any of that. But the day that Conrad Dobler got cut, Tom Banks and I went out and had a beer, and we just laughed. I mean, we were delighted that this guy was finally out of our hair. And then he was back in a, in a couple weeks, and, of course, the rest is history. And I was determined, since they gave me the second opportunity to play for the St. Louis Cardinals, I wasn't going to let that happen again to me. That was one of the things that changed my philosophy on football, that they didn't really care whether I made it or not. That had to be from within. Hell, when I was at St. Louis Cardinals, I had to go home and take a nap. I had to get ready for the next day. <laughs> so I knew there was going to be some more people I was going to have to fight. Conrad Dobler fought every day in practice for at least three years. I never saw anything like it. He fought every day, and he fought anybody that got in his way, and he did that until he developed into a good football player. And that's why the coaches kept me around, because I had the uh, chutzpah, the intestinal fortitude, the guts, the, uh, I had it in the eyes to go out there and to play, to compete, to win. And they liked that about me, and the thing is I felt that I had to keep that type of aggressiveness there, because that's the thing that got me started. Now, when he first started in this league, he was... Uh, not a very talented football player. Chances are that he missed this block at the line of scrimmage. But what he did is he got up, he ran downfield, and knocked somebody down. He knocked down a linebacker, he knocked down a defensive back, he hustled and ended up making a play. Then what happened is that uh, over the years he really developed into a good football player. He developed into one of the best pass-protecting guards uh, that this game has seen. His techniques sometimes were bizarre. He would kick, he would leg whip, he would trip, but his man didn't get to the quarterback. And what happened is that this image of being the game's dirtiest player overshadowed all his accomplishments on the field as being a good football player. You know, a lot of people have talked about uh, the leg whips and things like this, but uh, I always thought we should have gotten points for that because I thought those were great athletic moves. But to be mobile and to be athletic like that, I think uh, I think th those were classical moves. But, you know, everyone would accuse me of this biting stuff, but and I've asked many, many people, if someone puts his fingers in your mouth in the field of combat, what, what are you going to do? One time we played the Cowboys in Dallas. Leroy Jordan put his hand up inside Conrad's face mask. Now, I don't know if it was to stroke his mustache or to conduct some sort of mayhem on Conrad's person. I don't know. All I know is that on their way up Conrad's face, his little fingers made a pit stop around Conrad's mouth. Leroy started yelling like there was no tomorrow. I don't know if I ever really broke rules. I think that I was a master at playing in the gray area of every rule ever made. I played in the gray areas and I was the best at it. Well, let's be honest about it. Conrad Dober was a self-styled and a factual dirty player. That was his way of compensating for a lack of some basic skills. And by getting people to forget that they were playing football and think they were in a street fight, he got the advantage because he was a good street fighter, not nearly as good a football player as he was a street fighter. That was my philosophy, is take the man out of his game, and then you own him. The more they concentrate on what I'm doing, the more they're concerned about me, they're not concentrating on the guy with the hoochie, the guy with the football. And as long as they're doing that, I don't even have to block the man. And I think Dober's the only guy that ever really got me to a point where I was angry enough to take a swing. Looking back, I got right on his level when I did that and, and quit playing the kind of football that I could have controlled him with and started trying to play the kind of football he wanted to play. Merlin lost his poise, and that's what bothers him more than anything else. Not any of the things that happened on the field, not the violence, not the combat, not the blocking, not the hitting, not the punching. It was him losing his poise. And when the fourth quarter came along, he took himself off the field and I was still out there. You're right, you're damn right. He won't send me any flowers. <laughs> After he'd uh, been traded around a bit, he ended up in Buffalo. And I was down to do the game for NBC. And Dobler's mother and father were there. About that time, Conrad's father came over. You don't like my son, do you? Mr. Dobler, I said, I really had kind of put that behind me. I said, as a matter of fact, at practice today, I shook hands with Conrad. He said, you shook hands with my son? I said, yes. He said, count your fingers. In Buffalo, Dobler's reputation finally caught up with him. Officials took away the gray area in which he had flourished. And his career ended not as Comrade Dobler, three-time All-Pro,
but simply the dirtiest player who ever lived. I think my only regret is that because of all this hype, because of all this good copy, people, um, people forget that, it, you know, maybe I did have a little bit of talent. Maybe I did do something a little bit different. I was a survivor. I had talent. And I think that's, they forget that I was a player of substance. I was the best at my position at one time. Tough guys. Not only do they have to be able to dish out punishment, they have to be able to absorb pain as well. And for 14 seasons, the Rams' Jack Youngblood put the hurt on ball carriers even when he was hurting himself. In fact, he played in Super Bowl XIV with a broken bone in his leg. And San Diego's Dan Fouts. Now, he was my kind of quarterback. During his 15-year career, he took his share of violent shots. But he never complained. And every time he bounced back and he claimed another passing record. Youngblood and Fouts, two tough guys whose courage and durability enabled them to give new meaning to the old adage, no guts, no glory. Los Angeles in the 1970s was the wrong city and the wrong decade for a backward young man from a backwater town in Florida. This psychedelic city of freeways, free spirits, and free love was a bad trip for Jack Youngblood. When I came to Los Angeles, it was, it was a horrifying experience. I was supposed to stay for like three days. I jumped on the plane after the second day, left, could not stand this place, was totally petrified. I'd never seen that, you know, that many people in my entire life. 61. But the scariest thing was how easily the rookie defensive end was flattened. He made uncountable mistakes until pass rushing became as simple as one, two, three. Speed, quickness, and finesse knowing your game, knowing what to do, to instantaneously be able to react to what a larger man's gonna do to you. A lot of people never knew how light Jack was towards the end of a football season. If you played against Jack in December, he was down to 237 pounds. And here's a guy who played every down. We're not talking about one of these designated guys. We're talking about a guy that would stand in there and take on an offensive tackle. Jack Youngblood is one of the greatest people I've ever known to have on your ball club when things are going bad because he will pick you back up. He'll turn you around and won't let your players get down. Although he was a man of action, his bark was as bad as his bite. Jack talks all football game. I mean, the guy never shuts up. And he, he goes into this falsetto voice when he gets excited. It's, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it would break glass. Jimmy Hart uh, was our quarterback. It was my job to protect Jimmy. And all game long, whenever I'm blocking Jack, Jack would be going, Jimmy, 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 here I come, Jimmy. He was the John Wayne of pro football, Hollywood handsome, cowboy tough. He played muddied and bloodied and won the red badge of courage for enduring more than his share of pain on this battlefield. I thought I'd been bitten by a spider and I just had some swelling in the arm. The third day comes along and it's getting rather bothersome, a nuisance. I couldn't bend my fingers, couldn't put my, couldn't put my watch on, things like that. There were indications that something might not be quite right. So I, so I go in, the trainer looks at it, he almost faints. So at that, I'm saying to myself, something is bad wrong here. He jumps on the phone, they call the doctors, one thing leads to another. I'm in the hospital that evening in uh, emergency surgery. And they open me up and pull out this foot-long hot dog. In a playoff game at Texas Stadium, Youngblood's right leg was caught in a cowboy vice and snapped. Hurt. It was swollen. 
and you could feel the knot, you could feel where the leg had been broken. The doctors are all looking at it and they're feeling it and they're going, no, 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 you can't do this. I said, tape the thing up and we'll worry about it when the game's over. Win, lose, or draw, then that's the time to worry about it. You can't worry about it now. I can still walk on it and still run. Tape it up, give me two more aspirin, and let's go play. Youngblood returned, and with him came victory. The next week, number 85 was knocked down. But it was the Buccaneers who were knocked out of the NFC Championship. He played his third game on a broken leg in the Super Bowl. It was my responsibility to be an inspirational player, play by example. Even in defeat, he played with the style that made him a star and the toughness that made him a hero. I don't consider myself tough. I, think I consider myself a nut sometimes <laughs> for some of the things that I did. If I could have done anything any different, it would be that I would still be able to play. I loved it. It was so thrilling that I didn't want to miss one minute of it. Look up the word tough in the dictionary, and you'll see a picture of Dan Fouts. Dan has, has been in the league a long time. He's seen every defense there is to see. He's taken every hit there is to take. He's been hit by every player there is to hit him. And yet he stands in there and will throw the ball and direct the team uh, in an unflappable way. Over the years, he's just been the, the toughest person I've ever seen play football. And it's pretty different to say that about a quarterback because you know, there's not too many physically tough quarterbacks in this league, but, but Dan has been over the years. <laughs> He's just a very mentally tough person. He goes out there and he takes some hard shots and just continues to play hard and doesn't show anybody his pain. I saw him in the Raider game a couple years ago with the face splattered, or his nose splattered all over his face and uh, stuck cotton up his nose and a big uh, piece of tape across it. You know, blood dripping down the front of his chin and under his jersey. Most guys would come out of that game, maybe go in at halftime and get x-rayed and have his nose set. Dan continued and he didn't miss a snap. To imagine the headache that a person would have from a broken nose, it would almost automatically kick you out of a game, but he stayed in that game, so mental toughness has to be a great day. If toughness is judged by what you take rather than how much you dish out, then Dan Fouts is the toughest quarterback who ever played pro football. Since he was drafted on the third round by the Chargers in 1973, Fouts has demonstrated a single-minded determination similar to the man he replaced, John Unitas, number 19. It was this Hall of Fame legend who first helped to mold Fouts into a pro quarterback. Well, it was a dream come true for me to just be on the same field with Johnny Yu. Really, the highlight of my career at that point was uh, my association with him. I found him very easy to talk to, very, uh, uh, he was always ready to help me whenever I needed help. Uh, in fact, I needed a lot of help in those days. Even with the help of a legend, Fout struggled as the Chargers won only two games. Still, through the mistakes of a rookie, the potential for greatness was clearly visible. He had a strong mental attitude, mentally tough, and it was fun at being able to work with him. We would work together and, and uh, on different pass patterns and, and offensive, and so just talking back and forth and thinking. And we had one of the coaches come up to me, and he, and he told me, we don't want you telling Fouts what to do anymore. I said, I beg your pardon? He says, we don't want your phone with Fouts. I says, okay. So I said to, I told Danny, I said, look, I says, uh, I've been told I can't talk to you anymore. He said, you got to be kidding me. I said, no. I said, but don't let it bother you. <laughs> I said, I won't pay attention to those guys anyway. <laughs> In 
in spite of the coach's orders, the influence of John Unitas would help Dan Fouts to create his own legend in the years that followed. The Chargers evolved into respectability, then into championship contention under the direction of head coach Don Coriel, who made Fouts the centerpiece of the most sophisticated passing attack in pro football. San Diego's offense was nicknamed Air Coriel. And with number 14 at the stick, Chargers fans needed seat belts to keep from bouncing out of the stadium in the backwash of excitement. I really didn't make myself clear. Well, I, th I think I understood you. Is, is that what you wanted, a yeah, touchdown? I, I wanted to just take the time out. In the pocket, Fouts was like the platoon rifleman who waits until the enemy is right on top of him before firing. That extra split second of composure and courage required a faith that the receiver would eventually break open. His precision as a passer earned him seven NFL records. But it was his competitive instincts and a confidence that borders on arrogance that made him a great quarterback. Already, you're ready, getting all ready. Well, I'm going to throw this either for a touchdown or out of bounds, so don't worry about that. Okay. You better have a cocky, arrogant quarterback playing for you or you're in trouble uh, because uh, those offensive linemen and those other guys in that huddle uh, if they see a milk toast playing quarterback for them, they're not going to feel that confident themselves. I oh, got 10 plays in this, huh? Yeah. Okay. Up, at 85 yards and 10 plays, huh? Because once we start scoring, no telling when we'll stop, huh? Right. When we have some down situations, you know, third and long, he comes to the house and says, hey, guys, just give me a couple seconds. I'll get the big play. Okay, listen, we're going downtown now, so give me extra time. The look in his eyes, stepping into that huddle, was like, you got to believe you got to know that this thing is going to happen. All right. We got a 088 now, Gary. If you get pressed, run me a 7, okay? Got good depth on your 8, though. Split left, Liz, 088 on white. Ready? Leadership qualities. I mean, other guys, if leadership is thrust upon them, uh, they accept it. But Dan Fouts insists upon it. He won't accept anything else. Let's have a look, Jerry. First down, Jerry. First down. Uh, Give us a mark, will ya? What kind of mark is that? His head was five yards down the field. Oh, 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 oh that's oh. bull oh. What about on this side? Yeah, Bring it in. in. Bring it's it in. It's a horse <laughs> mark. Well, oh, that's two bad marks in a row. I can't believe it. Dan is a fierce competitor. And when he's out on that field, people's emotions and their feelings are secondary to what it takes to win the ball game. And I understand that as a player who's played with him for quite some time. Some people don't. Come on, run out of the brakes now. Lean it on Run out of the brake. You run out of the brakes. I'm running out the brake. Tippy toe like a I will. And you're out of here. You're out of here. Some people think that Dan is a little overzealous on the field. But I think Dan is the main reason for the success that we've had as an offensive unit since I've been here. Green 30! Green 30! Hunt one, hunt! Dan Fouts has cultivated an image of fierceness that is cold and calculating, immune from pressure, intimidation, and even pain. Playing during pro football's glamour years, number 14 is a reminder of its primeval past, a player whose personal courage has given him a unique power of leadership. Red ball, red ball! Red ball! 11, 11, that's okay! 11! 11! Thank you. 
Dan Fouts, one of the greatest, and perhaps the toughest quarterback ever. Well, Bradovich, Taylor, Lambert, Bavaro, Dobler, Youngblood, and Fouts. Seven men who owe their success to the hard as nails personality. Seven men who outfought and outlasted the competition. And seven men who typify what the NFL is all about. Now, each of them earned a designation, tough guy, and each of them deserves to wear that designation like a badge of honor.